Hello everyone, my name is Adam, Adam Schmuder, and I'm a student at the University of Rhode Island. As part of our Honors Colloquium on Cybersecurity and Privacy, I have with us a very special guest. With us is U.S. Congressman James Langevin, who serves on the House Committee on Armed Services, where he is a ranking member of Intelligence, Emerging Threats and Capabilities, Sea Power, and Projection Forces. For many years, cybersecurity has been on our minds, and we're fortunate to have an expert here who is looking out for our interests as Rhode Islanders. It's good to see you, Mr. Congressman. Thank you for coming in. Adam, it's great to be with you. So, if you don't mind, can we just roll up our sleeves and just jump right into the topic? Let's do it. Sounds right. good. Throughout your time in public service, what experiences led you to get interested in cybersecurity, and when did it all begin? Sure. Well, um, it, it's an important topic, and it's something that's going to be with us for uh, many years to come, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, but I first came to understand the challenges that we face in cyberspace when I uh, was served as chairman of a Homeland Security subcommittee that had jurisdiction over uh, cybersecurity. The name of the subcommittee was Emerging Threats, Cybersecurity in Science and Technology. So it was a range of emerging threat topics that we had to deal with. And uh, my staff and I did a deep dive on cybersecurity when it became, um, it came to our attention that we face significant vulnerabilities and challenges in this space and uh, that it posed uh, great threats to our, to our country and to the, the people of uh, the United States. And so um, in doing our hearings, uh, we had, in particular, we did a, a real deep dive, a focus on the security of our electric grid or the, the, the lack thereof. And what we found is that uh, it's possible, potentially, to remotely cause a made a ca major catastrophic uh, attack and, and, and failure of our electric grid that could potentially lead to a, uh, a whole sector of our country's electric grid uh, being shut down for a period of not just uh, hours or days, but potentially weeks or, or even months. And you can imagine how catastrophic that would be, especially with the dead of winter, both the damage that it would do to our economy, but also, in particular, the damage that it very well could do in terms of potentially loss of life. Again, being in the middle of winter, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be very uh, difficult to, uh, to uh, things to deal with, and it could be, again, catastrophic. Last week during your talk, you mentioned that uh, cyberspace is a very difficult concept to define, and that cybersecurity is, uh, is even more challenging to pin down. Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, cyberspace, if you will, is ever-evolving. Um, from the data that is flowing on the network to the systems that are controlled uh, by uh, and through cyber uh, space. And uh, it touches our daily lives. It, it's part of our telecommunication system, our electric grid. When, uh, when uh, flows of, of energy are regulated, uh, with, we obviously, uh, within that ecosystem, if you will, uh, we get our energy supplies from very varied sources that are then generate electricity, and on a daily basis, uh, companies modulate that that flow of electricity depending on the load. So, in the middle hot days of summer, and people, more people have air conditioners on, they're they're increasing the load, and at you know at, uh, times of let's say overnight, uh, when people aren't necessarily using as much uh, energy, and people are sleeping, and, and businesses are closed obviously the load decreases, and that's all modulated by, um, uh, through the, remotely, if you will, through the internet. So um, we're so dependent on it, and it's, and it's just, uh, again, ever-evolving, the, the reasons why we use the internet, how we use the internet, and with the internet never being built with security in mind, uh, we have basically security laid on top of the internet itself that is trying to protect us, but um, there are vulnerabilities that our adversaries have identified, uh, and they're exploiting it. Um, and it, I kind of look at it, and there's a variety of, of threats in the, in the area. Uh, first, you have uh, cyber hackers or uh, intrusions. So the hackers may do it a, for fun, or they may do it to, uh, uh, whether it's a, an individual criminal or a criminal enterprise that steals your personal information, credit card information for uh, criminal intent. In other areas, it may be for uh, purposes of cyber espionage and they steal intellectual property, particularly China has been particularly offensive in this area and that they've hacked into uh, countless U.S. companies, some major, some small, and have stolen a great deal of intellectual property to the tune of uh, billions upon billions of dollars. And uh, that costs American competitiveness as well as 
uh, American jobs because the Chinese then exploited, developed the products uh, uh, that uh, that we were, that our companies were designing and, and planning to, to make, and um, so that is a that's a real serious concern. But the thing that worries me the most is the issue of cyber attack, and sometimes that that term is overused. Right. So that's why I like to kind of de define it and, and put it into perspective of cyber intrusion, uh, cyber espionage, and then uh, and then cyber uh, attack. That's where the most damage could be done. Again, if our electric grid were ever shut down for a period of months, these generators that we found a vulnerability that could cause a, a generator to uh, cause itself to blow up. And these generators aren't just sitting on a shelf somewhere where you can, just like a battery, just pop another one in. They take months to build, ship, and install. And uh, if a number of them were hit uh, over, a, uh, over a very short period of time, it would be a long time before we could get it up and running again. Uh, it could do great damage if our money supply was ever ha hacked. and. Uh, cause uh, havoc on, on Wall Street or in our banking system. Uh, it's cause also same thing with our telecommunication system. So uh, there's an endless list of vulnerabilities and challenges and our job is that we have to do a, a work more aggressively to protect uh, our, ourselves in cyberspace if we're gonna ensure that we can't be uh, experience a catastrophic attack. So what's different between cyber warfare and conventional warfare is that we could potentially attack anybody or be attacked from anybody from the other side of the world. Uh, so With a few keystrokes, exactly. What, what years ago potentially could have only been done through a kinetic attack uh, using missiles or bombs uh, can now be done with a few keystrokes from half a world away. So you were saying earlier that digital weapons have the capability to not only harm and affect, but completely dismantle infrastructure. To what extent do we have to fear uh, this happening to the banking system or to the national grid? You know, it's a it's a very real concern, but right now those weapons, if you will, most likely exist only in the hands of nation states. And so I, I've often argued that the worst weapons are in the hands of nation states that really don't have the will to use them at this point, unless conflict were to break out. So China, for example, uh, could very well have zero day exploits on sitting on our electric grid right now that we're not aware of, unfortunately that could go actionable if they, uh, if they ever chose to, to use them. We're always obviously looking to identify them if they exist and, and to dismantle them if, if possible. But I can't say with any great, great certainty that we are successful in every case. I think there could very well be there. So again, the, the, the worst weapons are in the hands of nation states that don't necessarily have the will to use them. But then you have other entities or individuals who have the intent, say Al-Qaeda or uh, ISIL, for example, uh, with the intent, but not necessarily the, the weapons uh, to, uh, to effectuate a, an effective attack. And I would argue that the, you know, the, that gulf or that divide is, is narrowing, it's probably only a matter of time, before the worst actors get their hands on the worst weapons and, and they use them. So we're, it's kind of a race against the clock as I look at it, and I'm just trying to raise awareness of the issue and trying to get Congress and the administration and even the general public and, and businesses, particularly uh, our critical infrastructure as a business, uh, to do more to protect themselves and protect the country. All right. So in this day and age, there's also a threat of anonymous activity uh, and activism. Uh, and there's been cases where sensitive information has been widely leaked to the public. Um, how do we manage this when these activists may have hidden agendas on top of being anonymous? Well, that's uh, the anonymity on the internet is certainly a problem. Attribution is difficult. That's one of the, the dangers in, in cyberspace. Uh, you know, when you talk about the damage that could be caused uh, from uh, a, a catastrophic attack using kinetic weapons, basically it's probably going to have a return address or forensics where it's going to be easier to identify who did it, where they did it, you know, who they're from, where they're from, um, and, uh, and, and so appropriate response, retaliation is always an option, and you know where the, uh, where the attack potentially came from. Uh, it's less likely that you may know where the attack came from in cyberspace because attribution is such a hard thing to prove. Um, you know, for example, the attack may look like it comes from, from China, but was it the Chinese nation state that ordered it, or was it just an individual hacker? And you may not know. You may have a state using a proxy to do it, and by the way, it may not be just in that particular country that actually launched the attack or uh, the individual, they could do it, uh, make it look like they were somewhere else or in fact are somewhere else. It's a it's very difficult uh, challenge to, 
uh, to deal with. So attribution is something we have to get better at, cyber forensics. And I know that actually the, the URI has a wonderful program, uh, Dr. Victor Feywolf and Lisa DePippo. Uh, and they'll be joining uh, have, uh, us in these coming weeks. Wonderful. Well, they can talk more about cyber forensics, but uh, their programs, they have two uh, programs here at URI that are NSA accredited. I had encouraged them to seek that uh, accreditation several years ago when we did the first cybersecurity symposium here at URI. Uh, which then uh, Director of NSA and Cyber Command, General Alexander, was the keynote speaker for the event. And so um, that's where I think colleges and universities have an incredible role to play by training the next generation of cyber warriors and defenders. So we don't have nearly enough people going into this space. We need to have more people uh, going into the IT field, the cybersecurity field uh, in particular, and I'm thrilled that URI in many ways is helping to lead the way in Rhode Island. You mentioned a great deal about Chinese hackers mm. uh, and that they could be either nation states or lone wolves or proxies or, or all those sorts. Uh, what have we been doing as a government? Because it worries me that, uh, that something could happen. We, you know, Alan Dershowitz is a uh, Harvard uh, graduate lawyer and uh, author, and he believes that oftentimes when it comes to terrorism, we're very reactive instead of proactive, and that we need to switch our mindset. Uh, so what have we been doing to prevent Chinese or other foreign agents from hacking into uh, private or public uh, sector information? Sure. Well, A, we're trying to get better at uh, identifying the threats and understanding where they're coming from, who's doing it, we're trying to block them at every turn that we can. We're exposing what we know in many ways uh, for public scrutiny and raising public awareness. Uh, you saw just recently uh, in May the United States government, Department of Justice, indicted five Chinese uh, uh, members of the Chinese military and part of an elite unit. Uh, they were overseas? Uh, they're in China. There's, these individuals are, uh, they work in China in what would be per perhaps equivalent to our version of the NSA, but individuals who are basically uh, known hackers and have got into some very sensitive areas, uh, particularly in our, in our uh, private sector and companies and stolen intellectual property, millions of dollars in intellectual property, if not billions of dollars in intellectual property. And so those five Chinese hackers were indicted publicly. Now, we'll never probably see them brought to justice unless they travel outside of China and go to Europe or somewhere where we have mutual agreements with our law, in law, with the law enforcement and our counterparts and our allies. Uh, but the, 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 the symbolism of it was important, and it certainly was an embarrassment for the Chinese government. They were unhappy with the indictment of those five individuals. And there may very well be more indictments coming from what I am told by the Justice Department. Uh, but uh, we are trying to raise awareness and we're putting diplomatic pressure, of course, on China to stop the hacking, stop the theft of intellectual property. They have a very different calculus than what we have in that for uh, the Chinese, stealing intellectual property is a uh, matter of uh, state pride, if you will. And they, it's not only uh, sanctioned but encouraged and what happens is they uh, will steal intellectual property for the benefit of the state. It's then uh, exploited and developed, and it gives China potentially an advantage, both economic advantage or military advantage, and they see that as a, as a great thing. Uh, we, uh, we don't do that in the United States in terms of, uh, although you know, we have vast capabilities, we don't pick winners and looter, losers, so we don't steal something and then give it to some company to, to develop. And of course, if a company in the United States were to spy on another company in the United States and steal their intellectual property, there are laws against that. And there's the civil justice system as well. And they could be uh, brought to trial or brought up on charges if, if individuals were caught doing that here in the United States. We need broader international agreement on the rules of the road in cyberspace. And uh, intellectual thro property theft has got to stop. It's very different from the spy on spy espionage that you've known since, you know, you know ancient times, if you will. That uh, you know, spying on nations is something that every country does, but this wholesale theft of intellectual property uh, and, uh, and, and misuse of the information is, uh, is unprecedented and it's got to stop. You mentioned earlier about zero day vulnerabilities and that's how they often get into the systems mm -hmm. they're trying to hack. Um, could you elaborate on that? Well, a zero day exploit is a uh, virus or a computer program that if executed would carry out a function that could either send information back to the mothership, if you will, or uh, some, you know, whoever designed it put it there, uh, or it could carry out a malicious act. So um, you could have a program, for example, that 
if activated, could cause generators to spin up out of control and blow themselves up. Um, uh, we've heard about that wherever it came from, the Stuxnet virus, for example, that, that uh, targeted uh, the um, uh, Chinese, uh, the uh, Iranian centrifuges, and those centrifuges uh, allegedly have, have blown up and uh, uh, became uh, inoperable. So it, it just shows you that the capability exists to do something like that and could be used, for example, to cause a generator to spin up out of, con out of control and, and blow itself up. So we try to identify those, those, those types of programs and, and neutralize them, but it's not always possible. You may not know that it's, that it's there. We're always looking for them, but um, it, it, is a, it is a real problem. Do you see it as a possibility that a, um, a third party could get access to the Stuxnet code that uh, Iran was affected with and they could reverse the code and end up using it on us? It's always a possibility. That's something that I have you know, heard about that could happen and that I worry about. Uh, it just shows the, it may not be particularly that uh, virus, but it just shows that the ability to develop something like that exists and, and how it could potentially be used against the uh, United States or our allies. And, and so we always have to be uh, on guard to, to watch against that. The other thing that's hard, again, is, is attribution. You know, we've all heard of, uh, of botnet, uh, botnet attacks and the systems uh, uh, get, uh, get overwhelmed by a particular cyber vulnerability by use of botnet attacks. And you have a bot herder who potentially anybody's computer could be affected. And then if the bot herder activates the, the botnet a attack, then you know, the, they're sending out uh, malicious emails and things like that are overwhelming, doing a, a, executing a DDoS attack, denial of service attack, and it could uh, overwhelm uh, a, a server and cause it to crash. Those, all, those happen so will these, too frequently. So um, will these agents be very organized to an extent that they have a, uh, a home base, as you earlier said, or can it be done in an apartment building Both. using just telephone lines or whatever, yeah. it, what else, whatever else is needed? It can be done by an individual, could be done by a nation state. It's, uh, it runs the, the gamut, including a criminal enterprise that uh, they, they operate, for example, in nation states that don't respect international law or aren't enforcing international law, or in some cases the law just doesn't exist to prosecute these people, bring them to justice. They can operate, these individuals could potentially be operating and are operating near, with near impunity. And they're not, we're not we're, they're beyond the reach of U.S. law enforcement, if you will. And unless we have international cooperation, it's very difficult to stop. Well, of course, uh, geopolitical realities uh, come into effect here. Yeah. What, um, do we have any representatives to the United Nations that are passionate about this issue and have sort of gotten through the guard of? Yeah, yeah many of our European allies, of course, are. Uh, very interested in this and working hard to protect uh, their own countries and working with us to protect uh, our citizens in, in cyberspace. But it is, um, uh, it is a real difficult challenge to deal with. And uh, Who would you say our greatest own. partners are? Oh, the Europeans. I would say the, the, the British, uh, the French, and uh, um, you know, the, the NATO-type allies that you would, you would mm -hmm. readily understand are uh, closely working with us on these things. But um, there's only so much that we can do on our own. And, and uh, the, United, the United Nations hasn't really spoken uh, with one voice yet uh, on, a, on an international treaty, if you will, on, on uh, rules of the road in cyberspace. I would like to see us do that at some point. And that's why the United States needs to better uh, continue to pressure the UN and to lead in this, in this area. With all of the threats emerging from the Middle East, do you see any uh, future uh, uh, partnerships with any of those nations? Sure. I mean, there are potential for, for partnerships, and uh, again, it's about continuing to make the case that uh, we, we're better off if we cooperate as opposed to try to go it alone, or if anybody in any nation thinks it's somebody else's problem, they're wrong. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco, uh, a major U.S. Uh, oil company uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, it was uh, attacked and had their computer drives just wiped out. Mm. So they face threats just like, just like we do. So. Again, the more international cooperation we can have, the better. The problem is that you have countries like China and Russia that it's not necessarily in their best interest to stop the hacking the, and the theft of intellectual property or uh, planning for the eventual potential uh, of war breaking out between our two countries. And uh, they want these area day exploits on there to go actionable if they, uh, it's a use of an asymmetric threat, if you will, or a weapon that could um, very little effort could cause great, great damage and degrade our capabilities to defend ourselves. Would you say that, that there is any um, movement
for a digital arms treaty uh, globally? Uh, not yet. Uh, I would like to see more, but we're, we're, we're trying. We just have a lot of work to do here at home. Um, and uh, you know, in some areas, we're more secure than others, but we still have a long way to go. So speaking of domestic uh, issues, uh, what have we learned as a country from the Snowden experience, uh, not only in what he revealed, but what it said about our security? Sure. Well, clearly, uh, Snowden, who is a uh, NSA contractor, uh, he uh, misused his position and had access to and uh, downloaded information he shouldn't have and, and uh, made, obviously, used that by, uh, by making some of it very public. And uh, he is a, he's a traitor and he betrayed his country and his position. And uh, you know, if, if he was a conscientious objector, if he really had concerns that the law was being broken, he had a number of things that he could have done. He could have exercised uh, whistleblower protections. He could have gone to uh, the uh, inspector general. He did none of those things. And instead, he stole the information. Much of it, by the way, had nothing to do with surveillance. And he didn't present it in a public way and then face a U.S. jury to make the case that something illegal was going on. He stole the information, went to China and then to Russia where he still exists, still stays today. And, and those countries are not great defenders of privacy and civil liberties. It's a joke that he would go there and claim to be you know, doing the right thing and, and making information uh, public. Uh, he, did, he did a great disservice in, in, uh, to his country and, and made us very vulnerable. Uh, and by the way, after all the investigations that have taken place, there was nothing that showed that, that the NSA was operating outside the confines of the law. It definitely did damage to perception, and certain people are very willing to believe their perception, but that's not the, the reality. Um, Could you tell us more? Well, I can say that uh, after all the IG investigations of the Justice Department and congressional oversight and hearings, no one was shown to have been abusing authority, that there were sufficient checks and balances in place, and that they were doing what they were supposed to do with court orders if there was any surveillance that it was taking place. Now, since then, the, the plan is that the NSA is going to be shutting down that, uh, that program uh, anyway, and the, the providers, they will no longer be collecting a vast amount of, of data, and it was just metadata, like, for example, phone numbers of calls, and nobody, there was very limited people that had access to those numbers without a court order with probable cause and making the case before uh, the, the FISA court. What uh, do you mean by they're shutting this down? Well, the, the telecommunications companies now will be, will be holding the data, and if it's going to be queried that uh, they would have to have a court order and so it won't be the NSA holding data that could be accessed with a court order. It's going to be the telecommunications providers that would hold the data and would only be accessed with a court order. So you see this as a joint and again, partnership? Not conversations, only metadata, the phone numbers of, of calls. Uh, so that if someone, for example, in uh, Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq were calling someone here into the United States, um, and we wanted to find out why and what that was about, there would have to be probable cause to determine why that was. And you'd only have probable cause, for example, if you confiscated a, tele a terrorist's uh, cell phone uh, or computer in, in, uh, in the theater of operations and you know, shown that they were, they were trying to contact someone around the world and, and we, would, we would track that down to find what, who and why. Uh, so what are the challenges and what can be done to maintain a balance of security and privacy. You just went in detail about some of that. Yeah. Uh, do you see that as being sufficient, or do you see progress could be made? Protecting privacy and civil liberties is one of the most responsibilities that I have, I believe, as a member of Congress, that any member of Congress has. And we never stop trying to protect privacy and civil liberties. It has to be a balance. It has to be an ongoing effort. That means congressional oversight, means oversight by the courts, it means inspector generals making sure that privacy and civil liberties are protected and, and that every agency that has uh, capabilities are operating within the confines of the law. I see. So you said at the colloquium talk that we need to redouble our efforts to get younger people into this field. Mm -hmm. As a lawmaker, how should education policy adapt to this need? Well, we don't have a nearly enough people going into 
the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And by the way, I call it STEM to STEAM when you add art and design into that, which is important. We don't have enough people going into the IT field, or in particular to cybersecurity, people that will be cyber warriors or defenders. So we need to encourage more young people to go into this field. So it starts at the very, at the youngest ages, and uh, boys and girls uh, uh, studying in things like uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, computers. I mean, it's, it's the younger generation, of course, uh, they're great to appeal to because they've grown up with this technology. How is Rhode Island getting involved? Well, we're doing a couple of things. Uh, first of all, at our colleges and universities, they're developing programs to educate people in the area of cyber-related uh, issues and uh, offense or defense, and uh, particularly in the defense area. Um, also at the high school level, I'm a big believer in, in supporting our career and technical education programs. Uh, much of that could be in advanced manufacturing or IT, and uh, again, could also be related to cybersecurity. And I support programs also, not only at our high school level in the classroom, but also programs like Cyber Patriot um, or uh, the other type of, of cyber, uh, the silent, cyber, silent, cyber challenge program out there that, uh, that has young people basically participating in cyber exercises that, um, that test their cyber skills and uh, we recognize the, the, the most proficient with uh, awards and prizes. But it's a way of getting these kids to think about a career in cyber. Uh, Wes Warwick actually had a Hour of Code, which is a nationwide event to teach uh, basic coding skills to kindergartners and first graders. And you wouldn't believe um, that parents were actually telling the teachers that they were learning from their children. Uh, they were learning all these technical uh, uh, vocabulary and they're learning how to use uh, flash drives and different programs to make uh, animated characters move and mm -hmm. you know that's a really a different step for how it was a few generations ago of course sure so well, starting at a young age I mean, how yeah, do you feel about that I think it's great the younger they are the more comfortable they are with technology they're growing up with it and so we need to see more of that let's encourage it and force to that interest and and again hopefully it leads to a career in, in cyber anybody knows that you know uh, especially the older we, we are um, you know if you have a problem with your your cell phone or your computer um, ask a 12-year-old to fix it, because they'll probably be able to do it pretty quickly and easily. <laughs> so what can URI, Brown, Rhode Island College, uh, college students that have these skills, what can they look forward to? Well, first of all, continue to study in this field. I think the, the collaboration or the, the work that's being done in our colleges and universities, like at the high school levels, uh, very important for educating the next generation. Hopefully this leads to a very good, uh, well-paying job in, in, a, in a rewarding career field. But uh, continued collaboration is important. The more we can pool our resources, the better off we will be. And that's one of the things that I think is great about Rhode Island, the fact that it's such a small state. We can foster that collaboration and get the key stakeholders around a table. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and I just did a uh, cyber policy group uh, meeting yesterday at Rhode Island Emergency Management Agency. And we had representatives from colleges and universities, as well as state police and the National Guard, and, uh, and also industry uh, who were there. And uh, again, we can foster that public-private partnership, that collaborative environment, to see how we get to a much better place uh, in securing both Rhode Island and the country in cyberspace. So if they want to get involved with the government, how could they go about doing that? Well, there may be internships that they can take uh, advantage of, which I highly encourage anyone to take advantage of those types of internships wherever possible. Um, that could be a, at the state level or in, in business and in industry. That's a, that's a great place to, to step up and to start. Uh, there are also different programs out there uh, that, that challenge young people. Again, the Cyber Patriot Program or Cyber, Cyber Challenge Program, and there are many others. So if there are opportunities that students can pursue, I would encourage them to look into those things and, and, uh, and see what they can do to offer their, uh, their talents and test their talents and develop them. I'm sure that these challenges will be solved. Thank you so much, Congressman Landrin, for coming in to discuss these vibrant topics. I'd also like to thank the University of Rhode Island and our students for tuning in. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Great to be with you.